Welcome to the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. These podcast episodes with Will and his guests provide you with insights on how you can transform your excuses into results to benefit yourself, your family, your friends, your community, society, humanity, and the universe with what Will calls the ripple effect. Will's mission is to empower one billion people via the ripple effect and intends that you'll become another person to add to the count having listened to this episode. Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston. This is episode number 128 and in this episode I'm joined by James Martin. James Martin is a pioneer for dyslexics in business. As a self-made multimillionaire with incredible success in a variety of industries, James has forged his way to success despite the odds and despite being unable to read or write. Like many dyslexics, James's schooling experience was fraught with failure and frustration. Labelled as a naughty child and unable to grasp even the basics of literacy, he was found by the schooling system, leaving at 15 with no qualifications and no prospects for the future. But James had something they hadn't counted on, an entrepreneurial spark. It didn't matter that he couldn't read and write, he had a strong drive to succeed and an unusual ability to look at things from a different angle. His dyslexia didn't give him just struggles, it gave him strengths too. Half a century on, James has created a multi-million pound business empire and left the trail of success behind him. From a seven-figure agricultural consultancy business to various large-scale property development projects, leisure and hospitality businesses. James believes that dyslexia doesn't have to hold you back and your success doesn't come down to your ability to read and write. Dyslexics have their own strength, their own incredible ways of viewing things that others can't, an unseen superpower. Through his mentoring and consulting, James is paving the way for other dyslexics in business, working with dyslexics, the parents of dyslexic children and corporations. James is creating awareness of the benefits of dyslexic thinking in business and inspiring creative change for new, more diverse future for industry and commerce. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the superpower of dyslexia. So James, welcome to the show. Hello, welcome. Hello. So James, in terms of your world, um, the way that you've experienced your world is very different to how many people have experienced their world based on a superpower that you have, as you put it, which is dyslexia. And many people have heard of dyslexia. There'll be many people listening to this that have an element of dyslexia, but yours is quite... I suppose, bad or good, whichever way you want to look at it, right? So for for people that um, are are, are maybe not aware of you as of yet, um, how do you you personally um, experience dyslexia? And then we're going to go into that in more detail. Yeah, I think dyslexia is, is, um, it's something that people flippantly band around sometimes. And people, oh, actually, I've got a bit of dyslexia. And there are different levels and, and different, different severities of it i'm i would call my dyslexia chronic dyslexia i don't read or write my own name and address still in my 60th year i still can't do that without mega concentration and um focus so there are different spectrums of it Uh, we talk about the dyslexias and we talk about adhd we talk about dyspraxia and it's all a set of titles, in my my layman's opinion, or my my opinion of someone that that, that has lived with it all my life. Um, it's to do with digestion of information. Will that that that's mm. how I see it, and then how 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 you cope with that in your environment. And, and I think what you've just said there, in, in terms of summarising it, is the digestion of information. Because yeah. a lot of people, like you, you are, like I said, I've had the pleasure of. Um, getting to know you very well over the, the last year or so, and you are an incredible learner. Yes, yeah, like love you, it. You, yeah. You, you, you absorb information at a rate of knots, but you just learn it in a different way to many other people. So yeah. where a lot of people will learn from reading and, 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 and whatnot, you have your own ways of being able to get access to information, but you've done that for many, many, many years. So it's not a case of that you don't learn. It's just you don't learn in the way that we've been traditionally taught to learn in a lot of instances. Yeah, I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the way 
before technology allowed me to privately learn by just looking at, at podcasts and listening to podcasts and, and looking at YouTube and, and audio books before that technology that's probably only the last 20 years that I've done it that way was immersing myself with people and it was just being next to people you know diving into a, to a subject I didn't understand and just go and rub up against them be with them listen intently to all the nuances and the the, the new language in a new industry and 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 digest it that way uh, make a lot of mistakes that was another way of learning so you can you can do self-learning but it's, it's quite hard and gets a bit bruisey um the 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 whole way that we're we're looking at, at, at information going into your head is not necessarily through a very modern technology that's called reading and writing i see that as a the, from the 18th century to where we are now, this modern way of digesting information. Yeah, and it, it's it's interesting when you put it like that, because like you say, for, for the majority of the population, it's only really been, like you say, the last couple of hundred years that they've had the ability to learn and read and write and schooling, which see, back in the, the majority of schooling for most people, it was over a hundred years ago when people started really started going to to school and learning to read and write. But before that, they didn't have to do that. But if you go even further back than that, and you and you think about tribe leaders, yeah, you know that they, they had a particular skill set, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, you're you know the, the the dyslexic gang, if you like, you know, way back, you know, to to, to the to the you know to to the the, the the groups and tribes as you've just said those guys and girls would have been the dyslexic group because they would be looking at things in a 360 degree spectrum they would be laterally working out smells wind tracking animals seasons and they would have been looking at everything around them and being influenced by that and making decisions by it and that's exactly how i work every day now in this modern world it's it's not looking at things in columns with a dyslexic brain. It goes in and doesn't go directly to where the reading nodes are. It will then race around the brain first. So it will look at it from an emotional point of view. It will look at it from a, a, a technical point of view, a futurized point of view. So if we do this now, what does it look like in the future? So there's a lot more going on. And sometimes that takes a bit more time to come up with the right answer but the answer will not be the same as someone that just heard or read the question in a normal format. Mm. And you have, um, I mean, you call it a superpower, right? And, yeah. and you strongly believe that. And as we heard at the beginning of the show, it's evident based on many of the things that you've accomplished. I mean, in, in, by, by most people's definition, you're incredibly successful, particularly in business. You've built and grown and developed things, but not just in business, in your personal life, family life, and various things that you've done, which for a lot of people, they just wouldn't think is possible. And you've found lots of ways of, um, I, I suppose coping is the wrong word, but being able to, manage with the the challenges that you have and we're going to go into exactly how you deal with that and and that'll be useful but um you also have quite a strong opinion on the future of reading writing arithmetic but when i first heard you talk about writing arithmetic and reading you actually described it as a, a, an acronym Oh, we say it's, it, it's the war. So it, it, it is, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know, we, we say it that that those 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 elements in school. That's what they are coaching, grooming, scoring you on. Well, today's world doesn't work like that. It it, it works in a completely different way with technology you don't need all of those skills at those high scores. And just because you've got those A stars or you've got those degrees, that doesn't mean necessarily you can operate in the modern world that we're asking our children coming out of university or, or school to operate in. That, that, that degree doesn't give you a guaranteed job. 
when I am interviewing people for, for, for part of a team that we, we might be building on a new business, it's very different, Will. We're, we're looking for creative people. We're, we're looking for people that will be able to um, look at ideas from a different point of view, look at them at futurized. The, the conversation I, ha I had with you some, some months back was I was talking about 2050. I strongly believe that the fad of reading and writing and the necessity of reading and writing will just gently fade away. It will become a recreation sport to read a paper book, but further down the line with the millenniums coming forward now and, 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 and the, 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 the new set on the block, especially with AI, we won't need it in everyday life. Everything will be voice to text, voice to command, we, we, you know, Siri, it used to be Dragon back in the day, and then and then um, uh, Apple bought Dragon out and then polished it and polished it and polished it. How does that work in our phone? From a Scottish accent to a Southern English accent, that can still dictate perfectly, you know, mm. perfectly for us. And that technology is now going to be in washing machines, kettles, doors, everything. You ask the door to open, the door opens. You ask to, to, ha to have some instructions given to you, they'll be given to you on audio. And I strongly think that's the future. And, and I would agree, but in be inclined to actually say that it's going to be even further than that because there's technology that's already in process with that you won't even have to ask. Yes. You, know, you look at like Elon Musk Neuralink, you yeah. know, you wear a device and the thought of it will enable that to yeah. happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it becomes yeah. it, sort of it, something I have to... a sci fi. Yeah. Film, doesn't it and 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 where it always was you know star star trek it was miles away it's really rushing towards us now it's coming nearer and nearer to reality and we're seeing it more and more every every week things are changing so it, it's very exciting i, I love uh, it I, I really do like the to embrace that going forward uh, uh, yeah so science fiction is becoming science fact isn't yes, it yes you know? absolutely um, yeah but but it's, it's true i mean I've, I've been with you on many occasions and and yes you do send text messages and, and mm. you do that but you send a text message via a voice note. So you will dictate into your phone. But not only that, when you go, if you're scrolling through your phone and you find a particular website or whatever, you will then, you have technology on your, yeah. your phone that enables you to highlight it and it reads it back to you. Every text yeah. message that someone sends you, you press a button and it reads it back to you so you don't have yeah. to do it. Yeah. And I've, I've done that since that's been in um, iPhones. I've done that for, for the last sort of 12 years. And it's been a revolution for me to operate quicker, and um, get the information that I need faster. Uh, you, you tell me you do the same on audiobooks. I read at 150, so uh, one and a half times speed. That's, it, it sounds a bit Mickey Mouse language when you do it, but you can digest a book for you know a, a time and a half, a, a, a half the time. You can get a book yeah. digested into your brain, and and I think that that. What's not happening, what the joined up bit will that's not that's not happening is the, the the school system and don't you know don't get me started we'll be here for three hours but the school system isn't isn't catering for where we are really today and what tomorrow looks like it's still living you know back in the 60s with how they're trying to teach children to have these skills. Well, let's go there right oh, I want to okay. go there because yeah. I, I think you're there'll, there'll be people listening to this that your ideas could influence i know that part of the, the project for you moving forward is changing the uh, stigma around dyslexia but not just getting everyone to see it as a superpower but actually creating an education system um and i say an education system i don't just mean schooling system but education system for um further education people within professional organizations to be able to use people with the the skill of dyslexia to improve their organizations and we'll talk a lot, a lot about that in terms of the work you're going to be doing in terms of the dyslexic um, board members the dyslexic managers the dyslexic yeah. business owners there's a lot of work that you're going to be doing around that which i know is going to make a lot of difference for a lot of people but what was it like at school and knowing what you know now what do you think the schooling system should be doing differently i think i think the, the one thing that I, you know, if I go back to, to my, my, my school years, and that's a long time ago, when I walk into a school to do a speech or something now, this is state education. A lot of private education has embraced 
new technology and and um, specialist help within the schools for needs in the state system there isn't the money there money relates to education it's just it's no getting away from it it just does you're, you're going to get super nuggets of great teachers that really care in state schools that it, in, so not everybody's in tarred with the same brush but there is not enough happening to cater for diverse learning within those classrooms and when i was at school you were taken out of that classroom you were put into a separate band and you were taught differently from the rest of your peer group and and if you look at the psychology of learning the psychology of learning is that child is not trying to impress the teacher they're trying to impress their peer their colleague at school in the classroom sitting next to them well if you take them away from their their, their classmates and put them in a special class where everybody's confused in that class it's a smaller class they've all got different needs but they're all now in a new class where they're all trying to be taught the same way for one particular person in that class and that could be someone with autism it could be someone with dyspraxia you know and and, and what's happening is that the tailored learning was never done and you're you're and back back when i was at school i became labeled I became ostracized from the, the, the rest of the gang uh, of my classmates and I became an imploded person because it, 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 made, it made the stigma of it was in my small child world was crushing and, and what, what it actually did it, it stopped me learning and it stopped me having the enthusiasm and it stopped me also being able to have any type of digestion because I wasn't interested. It was just a grueling experience each day going in and being ridiculed by either the teachers or, or the, my, 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 my classmates because they had found something in me that they could poke fun at or dismiss in me. And Will, I go into schools to do speeches now, to, to, I do a motivation to talk for some schools, I can still see nuggets of that in there. So the, the change isn't, it's not a huge change. It's still, it's still on the same curriculums. They still get to the end of, of their 11 year, um, 11 years old, and then they split it into say four subjects that you can only carry on with. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, children still, still be learning to go forward with all of the arts, all of the sciences. And they're, and they're, what they're doing is they're, they're saying, well, now you must, you must make these choices. And, and I have a whole thought process that there should be more tailored learning for individual children in an individual way. My, my, my sensible brain is also saying that takes money and change. So it's not something that can happen overnight, but it needs that the conversation needs to be heightened with the government and more happening towards that. And, and, what's interesting so that, that, that's your opinion yes, right yeah. and, and that's your opinion as someone that has experienced the pain the emotional pain and the frustration of all those years ago yeah. and struggling through and we'll talk about some of the ways that you've 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 learned to to to, to work with having dyslexia but there's also some very interesting stats isn't there yeah if you there was a there was a survey done in uh I think it was in 2018 in Chelmsford and it was done with the local dyslexic um, association uh, or group in Chelmsford, uh, Chelmsford prison. And they, they did dyslexic tests for the under thirties male prisoners at Chelmsford prison. And there was over, I've got to get this right. Will I think it was, 45% were dyslexic of that group. And this is not a huge number. This is probably only about 130 people. But in that 130 people, 45% of them were dyslexic. And they were, they were people incarcerated for, you know, for misdemeanors to crimes, whatever, whatever it was. But it makes me... No, from my childhood, when I left school, I felt, you know, 
where do I, what do I now do? How do I even operate? I couldn't even be at that stage. I left at 15. I couldn't be white van man driver because I couldn't read the, the, um, uh, the, the addresses to go and deliver any parcels or do anything. So you're, 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 you're stigmatized with, with this illiteracy. And that's what it was called in my day. So they turn to what do they turn to? They turn to where they're going to get affection, or they're going to get they're, they're going to get someone to help them. And sometimes that goes into a criminal side of life, where, whether it be being drugs or, or or stealing or whatever. But the stats show that there are there are other surveys that have been done in America as well, and they're very similar outcomes of that. And then you go on to the other side of of, of that knife edge, and you go towards. The, the grit and determination you can end up with when you leave school, what do I do? How do I work in this, this, this adult environment? And sometimes you're, you know, as a dyslexic, you have no other choice than to go and do something on your own or go and find something to do that you've got control of. And I'm currently just finishing a book that I'm writing now. And I talk, there's a whole chapter we talk about there that is just about the grit and determination and, and finding what happens with you creating your own environment. And, and, and with, with that ability, you need to create your own environment to use it because it doesn't work in a so-called normal environment where people will just expect you to read, expect you to fill out forms, expect you to, to be able to do these skills. So you create your own environment, and that might be that you you start a self-employed scenario. You start a, a, a group where you, you you do services and, and and systems for somebody. You start working from a, a, a place where you can be creative in the arts. You start doing drawing and painting. It, it, you you end up having to do that because there's no other place to go, and it just forces you down that singular entrepreneurial self sorting out route and and that's why the other stat is you know you go there's a billionaire um survey that was done in, in north america and 40 percent of billionaires were dyslexic which i think is really interesting the fact that 45 percent of people <laughs> yeah. males in prison yeah. on this particular yeah. study yeah. were dyslexic and then the other extreme of that of yeah. 40 percent of billionaires mm -hmm. you know now yeah. i understand that money isn't the only metric for success but it's oh. a it's a scoreboard towards d determine on whether someone has has, has 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 achieved something and i'm, I'm assuming these billionaires aren't, aren't the uh the sort of the, the drug dealers of the world you know we're oh. talking legitimate business yeah. owners and, and yeah. whatnot and investors but it's a very very interesting fact and um Obviously, there's a very famous billionaire in, in Sir Richard Branson who is is dyslexic and has, has spoken a, a very openly about that, and, uh, and 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 I suppose has inspired a lot of dyslexic people. But well, I, I worked for Richard I, when I was when I was I had a gardening company when I was in my early twenties, Ruskins, and I, I worked for Richard and his and his um, I got very friendly with his his parents. And we used to maintain the uh, the Derry and Tom's building, had a roof garden on top. Um, uh, it was above the Rainbow Suites on the Derry and Tom's building. And Richard rented the roof garden and then underneath the suite of offices. And that's actually where he set up um, Virgin Atlantic. And he would, he showed me something up there that how he maximised opportunity. We, we would cut the grass and there was ducks and ponds up there and trees and everything. We used to maintain the whole thing for him. Um, you know, in a typical day, there'd be like five events on from a catwalk in the morning to a book launch to um, a, a car being craned onto the top of the roof, a Formula One to a nightclub in the evening to then a restaurant in the morning. You know, he just was churning the usage of, of the space. Um, he he has been an inspiration to, to me and to others. And through my my uh, my first businesses were were in uh, arboriculture, tree work, and and landscaping and gardening because it's the place I could go to that was that was that was you, you I could do it. You know, that, that's what I just want, I just want to go to that because I think this is this is important. I just want to take one step back quickly before we go into this because I think yeah. this is going to be very important. And there's a lot of lessons that people can take from this. We were speaking about you at school, yeah, and 
that school was hellish for you and you put in a separate group. What was the moment when things changed for you? I I did lots of stuff. I, I was a, 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 a mini entrepreneur at school. You know, I, I was bringing in pieces of, uh, of cake that my mum made to sell. I was mending teachers' cars at lunchtime. You know, you, you can't believe the things you could get away with and we could get away with it now. I was putting a gearbox in a Morris Minor for my science teacher at lunchtime, <laughs> you know, and, and he was paying me money for it. But, yeah, it, 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 they were different times. The, the bit that you just said there, what, what, when did it change for me? When I first left school, my, my father was, was very worried about me and just got me involved with a friend of his that had a tyre shop. And it was Colton Tyres, Terry Shepherd, and he sacked me within two weeks. And the reason he sacked me was I got my first wage packet and that was £35 a week times by 52 and it was like 1,800 odd pounds. And I looked at that and just went, I can't survive on this. There's so much I want to do in the year. This And the reality and that, that thud of reality just meant then this is not going to work. This, this, this isn't going to work for me. And the story goes on, Will, that I, the guy would deliver uh, distilled water in the, these containers and it was 50p a, 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 a gallon. And we used to sell it for one pound fifty. So I bought some off of him, and I bought some other products off of this this salesman that delivered to the shop. I took it back to my father's pub, and I was selling it in the car park to customers. I, I want to go even further back than that, though, because the, the the part the moment that I've got in mind, which is something we've spoken about before, was there was a moment when you were like, oh, thank God for that. And you were like almost free from the shackles of having to learn, yeah. which was when you got told. Was it, was it your mother took you to somewhere to be tested or yeah. some, something happened? And, yeah. and, and for you, it was like this enlightening moment that then yeah. took you on, or, that, that then enabled that trajectory. And we'll catch up to that part of the story. Yeah, but, but when I was um, 11, and this was my birthday is in December the 4th, and this was probably later on the next year, um, as we came back to uh, the September term, they... Uh, were very frustrated with me. Nothing was happening. I was becoming the disruptive child at school. So I, I, I was being, you know, in them days, caned by the headmaster weekly uh, for being disruptive. It was just a form of frustration, Will, that it was, you didn't know what to do with yourself. I didn't know what was up, what was down. I didn't get it, why, why I couldn't do this stuff. Anyway, they, they took me off to Romford um, and they had a dyslexic uh, teacher um specialist do a test on me and they asked my parents to come to the school a week or so later and i sat between my, my mother and father in the headmaster's office and it was the doom and gloom where they said you know unfortunately mr and mrs martin we, we we've, we've got some news that we probably you know we need to explain to you how it's going to work from now on in but you know, very, very sad to say that your your son is dyslexic, and um, you know that th th here's the certificate and the and the scoring that shows that he's dyslexic. So, uh, you know, that's all we can tell you. There was nothing in that room where they said, "And we're going to do this and do this to help." Um, they the, their one olive branch was to say that you you can approach the uh, the centre where we took your son to be tested um for extra lessons but you'd have to pay for that yourself and um thank you very much for coming in in my mind i just went oh that's great now i know it's this thing this word i can hardly say and definitely can't spell i can use that to just say to any teacher well there's no you can't teach me french anymore because i can't even read english so that's another lesson i don't have to go to or i don't even have to pay attention to and, it, and it, it freed me up because I had this handle, this 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 thing that I could parade around and say, oh, haven't you heard, uh, teacher, I am dyslexic. So see ya. And I was out of there. So from, from that age, I didn't do much schooling at all. And, right. and the real sad thing is, Will, I love school. I did enjoy the camaraderie of school, but school didn't like me. 
and, 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 and in the end, it, it was very disruptive with my personal um, relationships with, with the school people because I got picked on because of it. And that, that's what really stimulates me today to try and make some changes. And that's why, you know, I'm working with, with having a new brand of Dyslexic James to try and promote that there is change and it needs to happen in a bigger way. And, and, and then, like you say, that then led on to then going, right, well, if I can't learn traditionally, I'm not going to be going to yeah. university and things like that. That's when, right, well, I'm going to get to work. Yeah. And like you say, you couldn't be the white van man because you couldn't read the addresses, but something you could do was gardening. Yeah. Yeah. And the gardening thing, because what happened with the distilled water story was I took that, that, that product home and then sold it from my father's car park in the pub. And the guy that gave me the job just said, what are you doing? You can't do that. So he sacked me. And he said, you, you're, you're for other things in the world, so you can't work for me because you're, you're taking my customers away. So that went on. And then I, I started doing grass cutting. I started cleaning cars, cleaning windows. From, from say, 16 to 18, I would have pockets and pockets of money on me. Always have pockets of money, a couple of hundred quid in each pocket. I earned more money some weeks than my mother and father. I don't know why, Will. I worked seven days a week. I didn't have much social life. I had a couple of girlfriends, but I worked and worked and worked. And, and there's a, there's a, there's, I, I realise it now. I, I had to be self-sufficient because I couldn't have, in the adult world, the stigma of not being able to read and write. Mm. And, and, and from, the, from the age of 18, I had a personal secretary. I mean, how cool mm. is that? It's crazy. Mm. Just to read the mail, just to read the phone bill. Which you still have now. So yeah. your, your secretary, Christina, yeah. reads your emails to you because yes. you can't read the email. Still happens now. You sit down yeah. every day and she reads yeah. your emails to you too. Yeah. But you, you mentioned about up to the age of 18, few girlfriends. There, there, was a, there was a particular experience on a first date in a pub. Uh, you're referring to the, um, yeah, the themed pub. Yeah. I don't think it's there anymore. I hope it's not there anymore. Uh, I, I did a, um, I had a first you know, serious girlfriend. I think I was probably 16. And um, back in the day, you'd go out for dinner and there was a, a themed pub somewhere in Hornchurch. And um, we went in, uh, got our table for two and it was all going swimmingly well. And then I needed to use the loo, but the, the loos were behind me. So where she was sitting, she could see the toilets. So I, I got up to go to the loos, but because of it being a themed knights and kings and stuff restaurant, when I got to the toilet doors, they just had like old English writing on them that was hard enough as it was, but it was like maidens and and, and masters or something. It was something I can't remember. Anyway, long story short, I went in the wrong door. I went in the wrong door. And obviously when I got in the door, I realized that I was in the ladies toilets. So I used the loo washed my hands, came out. And when I came out, all I could see was this girl's face of horror where she thought, oh, my God, you know, who have I got in front of me? This, this lunatic, you know. And I sat down and calmly sat down with her and sort of, what's the matter? She said, did you see what you just did? You just went in the ladies' loo. And I very quickly just went, I always go in the ladies' loo. Have you ever been in the men's loos? They're disgusting. You must always go in the ladies' loos. And, and and just thinking on your feet, it just just about got away with it. But you know, there's there's loads of those stories of different different things that you know. There, there's a dark and light side here as well. Will I, I I can take you back to a time when I was in my twenties. I had probably thirty five employees, and I used to go to the to the bank, take a check. Um. It was the, the the payroll, and we used to pay back then weekly. And I'd always see the same the same teller um, uh, in in the bank, you know, Sarah. And I, I'd give her the check, and all I'd write on the check was the amount, and the, and I would say it's for cash. And she would take the check off of me, and she would put cash, write out the words for the amount, and then I'd pass my uh, oh sorry, it was on, it was on the on the checkbook, and she'd fill out my stub for me for for wages pass it back and give me the money. Uh, one Friday, got there, very big queue, a lot of people still behind me in the queue. 
got to the till and I'd realised as I was in the queue that, that that particular member of staff or none of the staff were, were the same. They're, they're all different today for some reason. Some people must have been sick or, or whatever's going on. Anyway, get to the point. They, I gave the, the lady the checkbook and said, um, could, could you just, just fill that in for me? And she looked through and she just pushed it back to me and said, no, you have to fill it in yourself. And I hesitant, it just, just popped it back and said, yeah, usually the, the, la the lady uh, does it for me. Well, she's not here today. You need to fill it. I said, well, actually, I can't. Could you do it for me? So she just turned on her chair to the back office that was on view and said, um, I've got someone that doesn't read that wants me to fill the check in. Are we allowed to do that? How, what, 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 what do we, can we do that? And by the time she turned back, I had left the bank. Now, it's not every day. <laughs> I'm quite open about not being able to read and write at all now, but I, you know, just some days it's just too much. Some days it's just too powerful, and it just, it's just, oh, it just grips you down. And 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 from from those memories of those emotions in that bank, it's taken me this long to be able to say I need to come out with this new this this new dynamic of dyslexic James to help other people get through not having those experiences and and things are different now and and but but that's one thing i draw back on to that emotion of that day because there's hundreds of times that's happened you know it's just it's just one instance and 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 what you said there i mean if you take the the the, the thinking on your feet situation yeah. with regards to when you you were on that date um the situation in that bank which is i mean it, so I feel it in my heart when you talk mm. about it, you know, because I can only imagine mm. what it was like that day. Like you say, that big queue of people behind you, knowing, you, and, and, and the worst part, but what, what happened? Because I'm not sure, am I right in saying that actually it meant that the people, your staff didn't get paid because of that moment? Was that happened before? Did, I can't remember you saying. The re Which, what really happened that day is I, 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 I left the bank. I went to a, a shop up the road where I knew someone. There's a, there's a girl I knew there. I got her to fill it in. And right. I had to ask her to do it. And then I went back to the bank and I queued up at another till that was a different person and got the money. Right, okay, my yeah. staff had to be paid. It was just, you, you, it, it was just too much that, that right at that moment in time, but you just have got to regroup. Grit yeah. Up. And you go again. And, and this, this for, for, for and, and any other dyslexics that are listening, they will get this. You have a resilience. And especially if you are, in the world of, 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 case, of coping in the world as a dyslexic will I failed daily on multiple times all of my life so failure is something that I'm very used to so when you then take you come out into the real world of business sometimes the the, the point of failure for some people they don't even start a business because they're so afraid to fail. As a dyslexic, it's just water off a duck's back. I'm used to it. I have the bruises, the scars, uh, the shell is already around me. It will just be just, yeah, okay, let's try it another way. So there, there are things, that, there's armory that gets built up by, 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 by just purely having it. And, and the, the thing that I, I think, like you say, though, is though, like, okay, reading a book and things like that, people go, yeah, well, you can learn to an audio book and you can, you, can, you can watch something on YouTube. And I know it's something you do a lot of and, and things like that to learn because there's something that I've read before. Um, it was actually, a, it was in, I think it was in one of Warren Buffett's books. And he said, I've never met a wealthy person that isn't continually learning, yes, you know, yeah, and yeah. You, you've, you've accumulated a, a, a very successful commercial enterprise you've got multiple different businesses you've built businesses you've sold businesses you've created property developments and built them and sold them and you've done you've done a huge amount um in your professional career still having this um challenge and but then you take there the other things that are very what, what most people wouldn't even think about like going to a restaurant and ordering food off a menu and you've created your ways of dealing with that as well haven't you yeah. now we, we uh, the the idea of being able to operate in the reading and writing world for for a, a severe dyslexic you need to have tricks and flicks so you need to to get your 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 trickery to those those 
focused events that's focused at the till with that lady that was focused so it might be in the post office can you fill the form out you need to be able to have that smiley face i'm ever so sorry i've forgotten my glasses is there any chance you could fill it out for me and but you know you have to take a deep breath get in performance mode and make that happen so you need to be ready for it the restaurant scenario is to eat out a lot loved it great i eat anything will I will eat anything you put in front of me. I eat from fish to pasta, anything you want. I'm not fussy at all. I have no choice. No choice at all. I can't read the menu. So I'll commonly just go, dunk, put my finger on something and say that. And I'd get things that I really didn't like, but I just got used to them. And in the end, I sort of had this trick of just waiting for everybody else to order on the table. Sometimes I didn't want my girlfriend to have to read the menu right next to me. It was a bit embarrassing. And then over the years, you do the waiter trick. And the waiter trick is big smiles, everybody's taking the order. Hi, sorry, what was your name? My name's John. John, you've been in and out of the kitchen all night. What's looking really good that the chefs and the team behind there are getting organised? And he says, well, you know, there's a beautiful salmon and there's a fantastic steak that's only just come in this morning. Oh, I'll go for the steak. Thanks ever so much, John. Thanks for your recommendation. And usually it's a very good recommendation, but you had to have some type of, uh, of way of operating in a very focused part where you are expected to be able to read that menu or fill that form out or do that check so you you, you need to be ready for that the whole glasses I'm, i wear glasses all the time now i never used to before but i always had forgotten my glasses i always broke the end of my pencil off sorry could you do you know i can't write because my bro you know, so that those and 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 dyslexic if, if dyslexic people will know that that they've got to build up this armory of of being ready to be able to use those that, that, those, those tricks and yeah i like you say it's it's it's, it's um survival really isn't it yeah. you know it's, yeah. it's, it's it's something you need to be able to do to survive so for, for people that are listening to this and there's going to be a combination there, there is Every person listening to this will know someone with dyslexia right now. So if they're listening to it, it might be their, their children, it might be their family members, it might be their colleague, you name it. There'll be and, and like you say, dyslexia is on a, on a spectrum. If they could give this episode to that person to listen to, or if the person listening to this right now has dyslexia, what's your advice to them to enable them to thrive despite um having dyslexia and and to start seeing it as a superpower and using it as a superpower if they haven't been to date yeah i, I think if it, if you take it in its early stages if you've got parents with a dys dyslexic children or child the, the the one thing is don't rush anything you know the, the learning process will happen um don't stifle them with 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 extra work or or, or, or just at this stage we'll cancel homework don't give them homework it's too, it's too frustrating it's divorced from the learning place and it's something that they've got to scarily do on their own and then it will probably involve the parents helping them that's even worse because there's frustrations from the parents to the child because they want them to be able to do it so cancel that i i, I have young edward he, he's he's 10 now instead of homework we will ask him to go on his ipad and tell us 10 things about sharks and off he goes, deep worming down YouTube and telling me all about charts. There's a digestion of different ways of, uh, of that learning. But what you, what you must have in your brain is that you are no different than anybody else that's out there. You are completely this. You've got the same cells in your brain, exactly the same as anybody from someone who's a doctor in university to you sitting there with no qualifications. Your brain cells are exactly the same. You can learn and do whatever you want. The advantage that a dyslexic person would have is that they would see it with more joined up thinking than perhaps the normal person that just gets the word straight into the word area or the reading area. As I said earlier, they will want the information to go around the whole brain usually and digest into a synopsis of the answer of the problem. And, and, and that's where dyslexia really has a forte. You mentioned earlier, my, my uh, mission is to get more dyslexic people in the boardroom. 
the boardroom needs better thinking people. If they're all thinking like they were thinking last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and a lot of them are thinking from 20 years ago, those companies will die. They need new creative thinking. Well, I know with someone with ADHD or dyslexia, you're going to get more disruptive lateral 360 thinking that will help that company be futurized because they'll come up with different ways of looking at what they sell or their services or what they're going to do. For sure. And what what is the future? You know, what is the solution in the educational system? What what, what do you see if you if you had the, the resources, the financial yeah. resources, you said it's gonna take time, or it's gonna take change and money, is what you said. But if, if you had all of the financial resources right now to be able to make those changes, what would it be that you'd be doing for those with dyslexia or yeah, the it, dyslexics? You you would you would do you would do dyslexic teaching for all. So you teach the whole class like they're dyslexic. And that is, is a huge advantage to, to, to the in inverted common normal learning children in the classroom. And I don't think there is a normal learning child. I think every child has a, has a different way of digestion. It's not just digestion, it's stickiness of the information once digested. So there, there, there are big differences. You need more visual learning. You need more story learning. You need more centrally learning where they're actually experiencing it by being out in the outside or being in the rain and, you know, uh, being in the environment and more learning towards nature. So they're actually, they're actually involved in, you know, why do we count counters? Let's go and count hedgehogs, you know, and that, that way it's a memory. So it has stimulation. It has stickiness. One in five are dyslexic. So if you've got a classroom, some classrooms now, average classroom in states was 30, you know, you, you, you got six kids in there. So you, if you took the, the sensory learning as mainstream, everybody, everybody gathers from it. Everybody picks up from it. And the real thing is that those classrooms, it's not all about t- small classrooms of six and 10. I don't, I don't strongly advocate that. I think those classrooms can be t- 25 people. The group go together. They want to impress each other. They're not really that interested about the teacher. They want to actually impress their peers next to them, their, their schoolmates, their buddies, their clan, their group. They'll learn as a class together. And the person that's 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 reading quicker than the, the dyslexic child that's reading less they then put them together buddy them up make them help one another and those stepping stones and tumbling over and the herd going forward then it brings everybody along you know you look at the wildebeest careering across the the, the, the flowing river they stay together and survive together and that's kind of the same analogy for the classroom But Will, that takes a new way of curriculum. It takes a new dynamic of thinking. It probably takes more teacher input, better training. All right, if I had all the money in the world, let's train all the teachers properly. Let's let's pay them all 80 grand instead of paying them 30 grand. They're teachers. They are our future. So let's give the teachers a better training and motivation to be wanting to be teachers trained properly. that would be my, my big wish, definitely. So that, that's the long-term future. And if a quick fire round, if there were three tips that you could give to someone, that if someone right now is in their, their, their teens, their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s right now, and they are struggling with dyslexia, what's your top three tips for them? So the top three tips is start loving yourself as a dyslexic. Really start embracing who you are as opposed to what you are and what people, you know, stop having negative thoughts about where you are with your dyslexia. So that, that would be the, fir- the first thing. You know, you, you, you know I, I strongly believe in that our inner voice is crushing sometimes. You need to change that. So start loving who you are as a dyslexic. That would be my first thing. Um, talk to dyslexic groups where you're in the same community. So reach out, find out Facebook, you know, find out where, where those groups live, even 
talk to you, talk to, to me directly and find out where the community is that needs a dyslexic super brain. And you will be pleasantly surprised for, for younger people. Ask if, if you want to be, we have, we have one of our businesses is, is, a, is a big wedding venue. If you want to be a wedding planner and you're young, go and talk to wedding planning companies and ask them and say, hello, my name's whoever I, I, I'm dys dyslexic and it, 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 it's um, something that I need to bring you up first, but I'm looking to be in your industry. You will be pleasantly surprised how business uh, owners, entrepreneurs, if they are asked directly, they will spend lots of time with you and help you. But it's just be forward enough to ask. As you 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 embrace that and, and your dys dyslexia is highlighted as a, a, as an individual, the one thing that just has to happen, Will, is you have to suddenly be people orientated, because the only way you can move forward is by charismatically engaging with people so i think that they're going to have to get and it's you don't have any choice you've just got to end up being a socialite within your groups because that's the only way you're going to make it forward because you've got to start reaching into that 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 those other other sort of communities that will help you but you've got to be you've got to come out for a better word you've got to be the dyslexic person that you are very good very good. Well, James, this has been extremely insightful. And I, I know that people have definitely taken lots of, 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 of insight from this, whether it's for themselves or for other people. If people want to connect with you, people want to find you, where, where can they go? They'll find me on LinkedIn um, and you'll find me uh, on dyslexicjames.com. Um, you know, speak to me directly on email. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I am looking to find like-minded people to help make a difference so yeah talk to me find me sounds good but what we'll do is we'll put the the link um to your linkedin and to the uh, the website in the show notes so guys it's okay. there for you to go and listen to and and, and uh, sorry it's there for you to just go and connect with straight away yeah. so james it's been fantastic speaking and um yeah. look I, I wish you all the best with your 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 mission of of enabling yeah. people to see the select here as a superpower and i've got absolutely no doubt that it's going to be fulfilled so uh, okay. yeah wish you all the best with it Thank you for your time, Will. Thanks very much. Okay. Everyone that's been listening, until next time, make it happen. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. Make sure you join Will's free Facebook group, the Make It Happen community. Please support the show by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Share this episode with at least one friend you think would benefit from it and give Will a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. Until next time, make it happen.